And thanks everybody. This meeting. Okay, recording. Sounds good. Um, yeah, good to good to see everybody here today. And uh, Sarah and I were just chatting about how beautiful it is outside. And so <laughs> thank you for being on a Zoom screen. Um, we'll try to make good use of this of this hour. And hopefully y'all are also eating lunch at some point. Let's not neglect <laughs> the, um, that as a priority. Um, okay, so hopefully you all know me. I'm Juliana with Leading Age National, which means I am based out of Washington, D.C., uh, which is sometimes a, a great place to be, sometimes not. But <laughs> right now, it is really lovely because there are the famous cherry blossoms. And it feels like maybe the only time I really succumb to the D.C. hype that is the cherry blossom season. Um, so we are in peak bloom this week, and it is lovely to see so many people care about flowers. <laughs> Um, okay, so I am going to uh, show some slides today. The topic is all about um, the future of affordable housing. Uh, and Sarah, I can't remember, did I suggest that? Did you suggest that? But anyway, <laughs> if that is a, um, a, a daunting topic, let's, let's try to tackle it uh, together. And if you have been on other calls with me, you know that I like to usually do things very interactively. Uh, today we have more slides than, you know, more talking at you than I usually do. Um, but I have some dedicated times for interaction. So some discussion questions and uh, the etiquette for this is please, you know, please chime in um, and uh, and you're you're among friends here. So uh, there you go. Uh, okay. And then before I get started, just a quick note that we do also host uh, affordable housing calls at the national level. These are weekly uh, on Mondays at 12.30 p.m. Eastern, and I see some familiar faces. <laughs> uh, we just love hanging out with you every single week. And uh, those calls are um, open to any leading age member. So right, anybody who's on this call should be able to join those those Monday calls and just let me know if you want to join. Um, okay, and I got a direct message in the chat that I just can't ignore. Uh, am I running the famous uh, cherry blossom race in DC, which is a running race? And yes, I am. I am. Um, so thank you for allowing me to talk about sports for a little bit. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's switch over to some slides. Um, okay. And then we can pretty much go right into, into discussion. Um, Okay, so can everybody see see these slides? Yep, looks great. Thank you. And you got to love these stock images they give me. I mean, I don't know about this picture. Does that look like, it doesn't really look like affordable senior housing, does it? What is it? I don't know. It's, yeah. Well, anyway, we'll, we'll roll with it. Um, okay. We're going to dive right into a discussion question here. There is no right or wrong answer. Um, this is just really basically, let's just throw out ideas right now. How do we as a country house older adults? Not necessarily low income, right? Just how do we house older adults? How do we approach that? Let's um, Let's do a little, just a little brainstorming here together. And the first person to chime in gets some kind of a cherry blossom reward <laughs> that I haven't decided yet what it is. <laughs> Oops. Oh, no, I showed you the next screen. Um, okay. Any thoughts from people? You can also comment in the chat as well. So feel free to unmute, but also comment in the chat. Thanks, Sarah. Okay. Um, Take a look at the chat. Uh, <laughs> we have a comment in the chat. Very poorly, indeed, indeed. We do not, we do not rise to this challenge very well. <laughs> so teaser alert uh, or spoiler alert. We um, could maybe skip through the whole hour. <laughs> uh, okay, and Kathy okay. said senior housing. Well, any what what else what, what do people have other service lines and the kind of organizations you all work for yeah 
Yeah, Jennifer says skilled care assisted living. Yeah, right. We have all these different ways of of housing folks, and so let me show you for real this time um, the leading age, the leading age uh, continuum uh, of aging services. Right, basically anywhere where an older adult lives or receives services is something that leading age cares about and works on in terms of policy, like how do we make it better and what's the future of it? Um, we're talking about home and community-based care for older adults, right? We're talking about affordable senior housing, which we'll talk about today. Um, uh, CCRCs, right? Higher end uh, retirement communities, uh, assisted living, nursing home, hospice, right? All of these different places. And of course, this is um, these are the more intentional spaces. Uh, we can't forget right, owner-occupied uh, homes, things like that. Um, so let's take a look at some demographics uh, in this country. So um, now these are things you may or may not be familiar with, right? These are just numbers. Uh, for the first time in history, more people are over 65 than under 18, right? So what do we, what does this tell you? Uh, we have uh, a, a population demographic that's going in a very particular direction, and that is trending older, right? Um, and not only that, but it's doing so much faster, right? So it's, this is not going away, right? So households over the age of 65 um, are increasing faster than any other group. So this we are on this train, this train has left the station. We are um, going toward uh, a, a more uh, older adult population as a country, right? And that um, has an impact on the kind of housing that we have as a country, right? Adults aged 55 and over are now two thirds uh, or represent two thirds of rental housing growth um, over the last uh, couple decades. Right. So so older adults in the market are this huge kind of share that we need to think about. Um, and and in fact, older adults are representing 30 percent of all renter households. So the right. This is millions of, of older adults. And we're going to talk a lot less today about homeownership. We're going to be focusing on on the rental side of things. OK. Any questions or thoughts so far? Um, so let's look at af the affordable housing side of this. Um, now, when we say how we house folks, we need to also think about, uh, older adults who are housing, have housing instability, right? And we'll, t we'll be going down this, this road today, <laughs> but look at these very stark numbers here. So on the top you have in 2009, 1.33 million older adults uh, with worst case housing needs. What is that? That means they're paying way too much to afford their rent or they're living in really sub substandard conditions so that they can afford it or both, right? So uh, really um, difficult housing situations and cost burdens, right? So so 1.3 million older adults. And then look at the look at the jump to 2021, right? Huge, huge increase in in those numbers. So let's just um, keep that keep that in mind as we as we go through this presentation. Okay. And let's compare, so we're starting with these demographics, right? Let's compare the uh, folks with, um, folks who are more likely to face cost burdens, right? The, we're looking at, we're, we're looking at a couple things here. We're looking at um, age, we're looking at folks with a mortgage, without a mortgage, rent, uh, et cetera. And you can see where the severe burden is, is the, the orange parts are, are a severe burden. Uh, and we see that folks uh, in the older adult category are 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 the one are the share of households facing more cost burdens, right? Uh, and we also see the rental part overall is is higher. So lots of need in the in the rental housing space among older adults. All right. Now some snapshots. One in six older adults live in poverty. Okay. But 96% live independently. So this is a 
high percentage for me, right? I was not necessarily expecting this. Um, although it's interesting to think about our definition of living independently, right? And what that means. Do any of us really ever live totally independently, right? Like how is that, you know, what does that number look like? Um, and, uh, and how does that come into play in affordable housing when we're talking about basically independent living with a lot of services, right? So that older adults can age independently longer. 20% don't drive. I'm interested to hear from you all if you want to put in the chat how that statistic is reflected in your communities, if it's higher or lower um, than what you're seeing. Um, I talked to a group uh, recently who thought that number was um, really low, so 20%. They thought it would be much higher. So just a thought there, uh, as we think about how older adults access things like services, um, and how they're able to to travel to get to them. Okay, and then one in nine older adults are living with dementia, uh, and twenty percent need help with an ADL, an activity activity of daily living. And again, if you if anybody wants to put in the chat how those how those percentages, especially the twenty percent uh, don't drive, the twenty percent ADL need uh, match up with your communities. Uh, and then we have a pretty high statistic here for ambulatory limitations. So that brings us right into a little bit of a discussion on accessibility. So this may or may not surprise you, right? You may know this, uh, that HUD's research shows less than 5% of the US housing stock is considered accessible. So what is this? That is um, meaning it has features to accommodate some somebody with even just a moderate mobility limitation. Um, so 5%, that's um, pretty low. Uh, and less than 1% of the, of the U.S. housing stock is accessible to wheelchair users. So we're looking at real gaps in, um, in accessibility needs. And then let's look at resident health needs. And this is specific to HUD assisted residents, right? Two thirds of HUD assisted, re HUD assisted residents are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. What does that mean? Really broadly, that means, and you all know this, right? That means that they have both a financial and an age-based eligibility for, for these healthcare programs. So we're looking at folks who are older who also have a financial need and therefore qualify for both of these programs. So two-thirds dual, uh, dual eligible uh, among HUD assisted residents. And this is all HUD assisted residents, right? This is not the flagship senior housing program at HUD, right? This is not just Section 202. This is all of um, of HUD's rental assistance uh, residents. So pretty, pretty high numbers there and higher rates of chronic health conditions compared to folks who are not HUD assisted. Okay, so we, we have accessibility needs, we have health needs, um, and let's, oh, and we talked a little bit about um, the affordability needs, right, with the housing cost burdens. So this is giving you a picture of the kinds of needs among, among older adults um, in, in the country. So that brings us to our second discussion question. What kinds of housing is actually needed for older adults with low incomes? Right. We talked a little bit about the different kinds of housing in general for older adults, but what about housing for low incomes? What kind of housing is needed? So let's uh, I'll just pause here and see what thoughts people have. Anybody, anybody? <laughs> Um, well, feel free to use the chat. Um, okay. Jennifer, I knew you'd come through with something about services. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Jennifer put in the chat more service enriched affordable housing. So those are two really key things, right? Um, yep. And Adriana affordable housing. Yeah, exactly. So, but let's look at Let's look at that more specifically, right? And the, and the kind of language we want to use uh, and the way we want to shape the future, basically, right? When we think about affordability, how do we house older adults with low incomes, right? There's a difference between saying housing that is affordable, meaning 
well, what does that mean to somebody, right? Is it affordable today? Is it, a, is it affordable at certain incomes? Uh, what happens if somebody's income changes? Uh, what happens um, if their medical expenses go up, right? So we're, there's a lot more to the housing that is affordable question. Also, it's affordable in terms of the location, right? Um, so let's look at another way to, to frame that, right? Right, Housing that has flexible, stable affordability. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that flexibility and that stability is so important. And just a, again, a little teaser here, you all know this because many of you work in programs that have a flexible subsidy, meaning if some, like in project-based section eight or in section 202, those are HUD programs, right? If you're, if somebody's income goes down or if certain expenses go up, their rent changes accordingly, right? That's a flexible subsidy that creates stable affordability for that household. Uh, and then there are some programs that do not do that, right? Um, like the low-income housing tax credit program uh, does not do that, does not change according to somebody's income in that same way, right? So just thinking a little bit more critically about affordability and what we really need there. Um, and talking about accessibility, right? We saw those statistics on accessibility among uh, throughout the U.S. housing stock, right? So how do we house older adults with accessibility needs? So once again, uh, we have this need that we've identified together as affordable housing, right? We need affordable housing. Um, and right now we have affordable housing that is sometimes accessible. And you all experience this in that if you want to make it more accessible, you get a reasonable accommodation request from somebody, you do all kinds of processing, and you try to pay for adjustments uh, to, to the physical structure of the property or to other uh, elements of, of the property, right? Um, and what we're thinking about more and more as a country is what about housing that accommodates but even more so, what about housing that anticipates resident accessibility needs, right? So if we're thinking about housing development, especially affordable housing development, we know that we have an aging population. We know that this population will live longer and will have more accessibility needs, right? Um, so why not build in a way that can anticipate that uh, or set the bar in a different place so that it's easier to, uh, to make adjustments? Um, and, and these are buzzwords you might hear every now and again, right? Like universal design, things like that. Um, so more age appropriate development. Okay, and then lastly, and this was Jennifer's point in the chat, right, more service enriched housing. So uh, how do we house older adults with low incomes in a in a health and services needs lens, right? And right now we think uh, about affordable housing that is sometimes service enhanced or service enriched. Right. So some of you have service coordinators. Many of you have partnerships with folks who come in and provide services, but there are a lot of gaps. Right. And so what we're looking at instead is housing that that has health needs built into it. So centering resident health needs in this idea that uh, that housing and health are uh, are connected in that way. Right. So this is our framework uh, as as we think about affordable senior housing and how to house this population, right? So we, and, and these are leading age pr priorities, right? This is a leading age framework, affordable, accessible, service enriched uh, housing um, uh, that includes the affordability to meet demand and housing as a platform or a vehicle to access services. Uh, and then we're looking at this idea of, of cross-disability accessibility uh, and, and age-appropriate spaces. So there you go. There's a little bit of a deeper dive into what we mean when we say the future of affordable senior housing, right? Um, so I think I have a pause here. Yeah. So well, let's just pause there. Thoughts from folks uh, or questions. And I also have a, dis a discussion question up here on the screen. Okay. Um, so let's just roll forward and maybe we'll have some discussion later on. Um, so the question here is, how does America house older adults with low incomes, right? So in that framework, let's think about what we're doing now and how well that meets the need, the needs that we've identified. 
right now, this country has significant supply driven initiatives, right? There is a, an emphasis on supply driven initiatives. What is a supply driven initiative? That means that we are, uh, as a country, focusing on the lack of supply, right? The lack of supply of housing in general and of affordable housing. Uh, and so that means initiatives that are focused on housing production and preservation. Uh, and the most uh, common one, uh, and this is the primary tool for, for creating new affordable housing, uh, and and I say affordable housing, but we'll talk about that in a moment, uh, is the low-income housing tax credit, right? And that is a tax credit that is used by, by some of you. Um, and it is, and I say it's the primary tool, it is essentially in some areas, the only way that afford more affordable housing is 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 coming online or being preserved, um, and in and in other in other places, it is uh, leveraged in addition to other tools, but it is still uh, required in order to move forward on development deals and things like that. So this is basically the the crux of how we're doing it in this country right now. Now let's layer in this conversation of older adults, right? So 30, uh, ooh, I think that's supposed to say 36, actually. Um, so 33%, that was, um, that number has gone up since then, right? So 36% actually of low-income housing tax credit units have at least uh, one older adult household member, right? So we're looking at this and we can't say that LIHTC is not a senior housing program, right? Because technically, it is, it, it's housing older adults, right? More than one third of the folks living there are older adults. So that is, um, that puts it into our category of how we house older adults uh, and older adults with low incomes. But can it be tailored to older adults, right? Can it meet those needs that we that we talked about before, right? Can it can it provide stable affordability that's flexible? Can it uh, can it be made accessible? Can it bring in it can can it meet health needs, right? So these are all questions that we need to be asking ourselves if this is the per, if if this is the tool we're we're relying on. Um, now, in 2021, Leading Age uh, developed a report on. Uh, what are called qualified allocation plans, QAPs. And if you're in the low-income housing tax credit world, this term is totally familiar to you, right? And you are an expert on it <laughs> more so than me. If you're not in the world, in that, in the tax credit housing development world, know that uh, QAPs are the way that states take the credits that are allocated to them and decide which properties get them, right? So it's part of a plan that each state has to to allocate the the resources they have for the low income housing tax credit. Okay, so this is basically the strategy that each state has. Now, we did a report in 2021 on each state strategy and we looked at how older adults show up in those strategies. Now, this is potentially a little bit out of date now because states update this every year, but at the time, seven states had established a specific set aside within the low income housing tax credit program for for older adults right for so for affordable senior housing so that's interesting um 38 states and that includes dc uh were basically awarding points to project in their um application process right so so properties, projects, proposed projects were rated higher if they were said they would specifically serve older adults. That's a higher number of states there. And then three states were uh, providing what's called a basis boost, which uh, basically gives you a leg up on the development, uh, ranging from five to 30%, which is pretty high um, for a project serving older adults. So what we're seeing is that some states in their strategy have a plan for uh, for trying to address the need for affordable senior housing, right? Um, now, what we are not seeing in the in the low income housing tax credit program is uh, is an emphasis on those other items that we talked about, right? Now, LIHTC does not have a dedicated path for service coordination, 
right? Like HUD does. There are no specific federal grants. There is no budget driven process like at HUD for, for service coordinators. HUD dollars aren't supposed to pay for a service coordinator in LIHTC, right? So there, um, there's no service coordinator path. There's no um, path for supportive services fees the way there is in, in some HUD properties. There also is not a, uh, um, a flexible subsidy in the way that HUD's rents are set to some to an individual household's income and fluctuates with it, like at thirty percent, right? In LIHTC properties, that does not happen. So it's it's about an income band, and if you're in it, your rent is at that level. But if your specific income changes, your rent does not change, right? So we're missing a few key things in our country's primary tool for for housing um, affordability for older adults, right? And what you what you're hearing from me basically is you can be poor you can be too poor to live in our country's primary tool for building affordable housing so you can be too poor to live there you can also be too um too ill right you may have services and health needs and accessibility needs that may not be able to be met by this kind of housing right so let's just keep that in mind now we celebrate the tax credit program as an important way of building new housing that's moderately affordable right so it's not that we're that we don't appreciate the tax credit program right but we're aware of its limitations so let's look at some of the other ways that this country houses older adults right um and and low-income folks in general so so we talked about supply-driven initiatives, and now we're talking about more demand-driven initiatives. What is that, right? That is trying to address somebody's demand, somebody's need for affordable housing, right? Versus trying to address the supply. This is addressing the demand. So that could be something like a rental subsidy. So if somebody's income is too low to pay their rent, you the, the federal government gives a subsidy to help them pay it, right? Um, and so uh, Section 8 voucher is a very good example of that. So those are called the housing choice vouchers, right? Um, it is that is squarely aimed at demand. It does not address the supply, right? And that is a purely tenant based um, uh, uh, subsidy. We also have public housing, right? Um, and that gets a little bit into a mix of, of tenant-based and project-based. And, and here we go. Now we're at the programs that many of you are probably most familiar with, right? These are the multifamily housing programs at HUD. And these are project-based. It is aimed at the supply of affordable housing as well as the demand. So like I said, the subsidy is tied to an individual person's uh, needs, right? And the rent uh, adjusts accordingly. And HUD contracts with private folks to both develop and operate affordable housing. Uh, and it can be either for profit or nonprofit, right? Uh, and HUD then covers the difference between an affordable rent level and the, and the market rent, affordable to that household, right? So the, the, this is the really key distinction. So what do we know about HUD multifamily housing. And you all are, many of you are experts in this, right? Um, and before we talk about the specific programs, this is an interesting statistic. So PBRA stands for project-based rental assistance. It means that the rental assistance doesn't necessarily follow a person to whichever property they go to, but it means it's tied to that specific property. So every so, so the designated units in that property are affordable. So these are HUD's multifamily housing programs, right? There are several of them and 60% of that type of housing, so 60% of the rental assistance through HUD goes to a household that is headed by an older adult or a person with a disability. So once again, even if the programs are not necessarily elderly designated or even designed to serve older adults, 60% of them are housed or are occupied by either an older adult or a person with a disability. So we call pretty much everything that HUD does in terms of rental assistance, senior housing, right? Um, but then, of course, we have the more specific programs. So we have HUD Section 202. You all are familiar with it, probably. It, this is HUD's flagship senior housing program, right? It is actually the only federal program um, designed to serve, to house older adults. Um, and 
An interesting thing about Section 202 is that not only is it elderly only, but it is nonprofit only. So this is a mission-driven program to serve older adults. And then we have had project-based Section 8, right? So similar to Section 202, this, however, is a mix of for-profit and nonprofit, and it's a mix of all ages, right? Oops. Um, but as we talked about at the beginning of this slide, because so many of the folks living there are older adults or, or a person with a disability, um, it's not necessarily not senior housing, right? Okay, so this is uh, a look, a little bit of a deeper dive into HUD's flagship senior housing program, right? And this should look a little bit familiar to you. Um, has to be headed by someone who is 62 or older and earning less than 50% of that area's median income. So again, it is, uh, it is tied in terms of eligibility to that geography's affordability. Right. And then not only that, but it's also tied to that specific household's affordability. So rents are capped at 30 percent. Right. With with some adjustments. So compared to the low income housing tax credit program, you can't be too poor to live there. Right. So that is a, a really important distinction. And let's look at Section 202 today. Right. You all probably already know all of the things I just said, but let's look at it today. Right. What are we who are we serving? why is it so important that we have this program? So the average annual income, and tell me if this looks, you know, familiar to all, to you all, uh, $14,000 on average is the annual income for section 202. 17% uh, are, of residents are over the age of 80. So we're looking at older, older adults. 49% are non-white. So this is uh, compared to much lower percentages in the general population of non-white households, right? So that's, that's interesting. And then an estimated 38% of Section 202 residents are frail or near frail. So this is who we're serving today. And here is a bonus question for, for you all. What percentage of housing assistance eligible older adults do we serve in America? So the question is asking, of the older adults who are eligible to receive housing assistance from the federal government, how much how many of them are we serving in in percentage? Any guesses? No, no guesses. Okay, Randa's guessing 40. That's pretty good. Any other any other guesses up or down? 40%. Okay, Randa. Pretty good. So roughly two thirds of older adults eligible for federal housing assistance remain unassisted. So that means roughly one third. So 36% of income eligible older adults receive federal housing assistance. Um, and uh, unfortunately, older adults are the fastest growing population experiencing homelessness. So meaning rates of homelessness are growing faster than, than the population of older adults is growing. Uh, so not, not good numbers. Um, and, and I see a few more guesses came in in the chat. Yeah. Okay. So compare this to our country's investment uh, in the housing supply that is specific to older adults, right? So creating new Section 202 homes, which we know have key things for older adults, right? They have flexible, stable subsidy. Um, they also are more service enriched, right? They have service coordinators in, in, in some communities. Um, they also have supportive services fees in some of them, right? So there are a lot of elements to Section 202 that are important for, for older adults to age in place, right? And look at this unfortunate 
uh, line in this chart, right? <laughs> now, I know I've shown some of you this chart before, right? Um, I need to update it because uh, what we're looking at is starting in 2005, the investment in new Section 202 homes dropped to zero in, in 2012, right? Revived in 2018. So came back uh, and then what's cut off of the screen is is not too much more. But what I haven't added yet are the numbers for this year and the proposed numbers for next year, which are not good. And we're going to get to that in a, in a minute here. So that takes us to really the last section here. What is next for affordable senior housing? So we're, you know, often many of us, myself included, <laughs> are in the weeds every day, right? But let's zoom out. Let's, you know, get on a plane and look down. What is next for senior housing at, in, in terms of the horizon? Well, we can think of that question in, in a couple ways, right? We can think about it as next, as in what's next this year? What's What money are we getting next year? What uh, what are we proposing to do in October, right? That's, that's the first horizon we could think about. And we have insight into that because the president and the administration just gave us a lot of information, right? Just in the last couple of weeks, we had two big events in DC that policy people like me pay a lot of attention to, right? We had the State of the Union Address, which is an annual speech that the president gives. It is the most watched speech that a president gives every year. And in it, the president will talk about the agenda for the coming year. And in an election year, that is a very important speech to give, right? So we have the State of the Union address that just happened, and we have the president's budget request that was just released. Now, the budget request is exactly that. It's a request. It is not a plan that moves through exactly as is, right? It is a messaging tool that shows you what the president wants to see. But that gives us a lot of information, right? That gives us insight into the coming year and what the president wants to see, especially on things we care about. So in, uh, even on housing, right? So how does the president try to address these housing issues? Well, there is a heavy reliance on the more supply-driven initiatives. Now, we talked about supply, right? Supply is not meeting somebody's immediate demand, somebody's immediate need for paying their rent, right? Supply is trying to create more housing stock in the country, which can take some time, right? It also is often a more indirect way of addressing a housing issue. And what we see a heavy reliance on is homeownership. So tax new tax credits are requested for first-time homebuyers. So again, su very supply heavy. Also a heavy emphasis on middle income initiatives, right? And the president in his State of the Union address admits to this. So this is not a secret. The president is trying to focus on initiatives that will in particular target the middle income folks. So we're seeing not just a request for new tax credits for first time home buyers, but also new tax credits for households that are moving up from quote unquote starter homes to then free up this starter home supply. So this is not a direct initiative to create more affordable housing, this is an indirect method to try to unlock the market, the general market of housing, okay? So these are some of the emphasis the uh, emphases that we see in the president's budget request. We also see a real um, effort to support state initiatives versus seeing more direct federal initiatives, right? So we see a request for money on housing and including some really good, more demand driven stuff like money to combat older adult homelessness, money for new project based rental assistance contracts, right? Things like that. But much of that money is going not di directly to households, but to states to set up programs and initiatives to administer, right? So, not a, not, so a little bit of a less direct path. So these are some of the themes that we're seeing in the president's uh, budget request. And the last thing, and I have to say it, right, that chart that I showed you right before this slide, that line of investment in new Section 202 funding is going back down to zero, right? It's zero for this year, and it's and the president's request for next year is also zero. So not, not good uh, on the 202 front. 
And when I say next year, I mean the next fiscal year, which starts in October. So this is, you know, right on right on our doorstep. But let's look beyond tomorrow, right? Let's look at the uh, let's let's look uh, what's next beyond beyond October. And this, I think, is my last slide or one of my last slides, and then we'll just kind of open it up for for discussion. Well, this year is an election year. That means there's more turmoil than usual. And we are already experiencing this, right? The HUD secretary, if you haven't heard it yet, has resigned. Um, she has submitted her resignation. She'll resign. She'll, uh, it's effective in two days. Um, so this is already a little taste of the turmoil to come. Um, another consequence of the election year is that Congress will not likely pass any kind of a funding bill for HUD on time, right? They'll push it until after the election. So all of this is is just um, basically a lot of uncertainty in the coming year. Uh, and then we have to deal with the next administration's priorities, whether it's the same administration or a different uh, administration. So then, so that also is change, right? So we just have a lot of um, question marks coming up for housing. But let's look at what's next next. So not, you know, not October, not, not November, not January, but uh, what about further down the line? And this is reflected in everything we talked about today, right? We know that this country is going through significant demographic changes, like we talked about, right? Uh, including older adult uh, demographic changes where there are more older adults and there are younger folks, right? Where there are more accessibility needs needing to be addressed, more health needs, right? And so we know all of that is happening and how are we as a country positioning for that? We also know that income disparities are growing, services needs are growing, right? Now, let's also think about climate resilience, right? We're seeing more and more data about uh, the kind of housing that is most impacted by the climate. And you all might see this even right now, if you think about properties that may not have needed air conditioning in the past, who are starting to really feel the impacts of excessive heat in some places, right? Or um, storms and uh, uh, or or the need for more of uh, more affordable utilities uh, and energy cost, right? Uh, so the need for more solar panel, right? So all of these kinds of climate discussions. And if we think about what's next next, and we think about the preservation long term of affordable housing and affordable senior housing, we're starting to see data come out about how much of the affordable housing stock is vulnerable to these climate changes, including sea level rise and things like that, right? So over the next 30 to 50 years, how is our existing affordable housing stock impacted? So there is a lot to think about in the next next category that we should really be positioning for now or maybe tomorrow, right? So when we maybe we have a little more time tomorrow to position for it. But um, so there you go. Those are some of the thoughts um, on on the on the now and the next um, for affordable senior housing. And this is just a plug for leading ages work on the hill. Now we meet across the aisle, right? Every year throughout the year too. But in April we do a big push. Um, and the, these are the numbers from last year, uh, and in, we're gearing up for another similar advocacy day this coming April. If you're in town or close by or want to come in, uh, you know, people come from all, all over, let us know. Um, there are also many times throughout the year when uh, congressional folks are at home and you can invite them to your properties, right? So, and Leading Edge has resources for all of this stuff to help you out. And you don't have to be an expert in anything other than what you're in an expert in already, right? Which is doing your job every day and serving older adults. So um, that is exactly what they're looking for is the, is the kind of uh, on the ground perspective. So let us know if we can help. Um, and if any of this is inspiring you to think about how we house people and how we could be doing it better, um, those are the people you want to be talking to about it. <laughs> All right. I think that is it from me. So I will stop uh, screen sharing. And I know we have at least uh, one question and we'll see what other um, discussion we have for the next few minutes.